Okay, so perhaps we could start since we only have now 53 minutes or 57 minutes. Um, so perhaps, Sharon, if you can take away the screen. Super, thanks so much. So good morning or good afternoon to all of you, depending on where you're connecting from. Um, I see a really nice group of both panelists and also participants. So it's a pleasure to welcome you all to our panel on restructuring power um, in conflict affected settings. And we're very grateful, of course, to the Knowledge Platform for Security and, and the Rule of Law for inviting us this year to this year's annual conference. My name is uh, Kimana Zuleta Fulcha. I'm the acting head of International Ideas Constitution Building Program, and I will be moderating this panel. Um, and let me perhaps just say a few words about International Idea for those of you who may not know our institution. Um, so International Idea is an intergovernmental organization. We have 33 member states. I heard um, to be 34 very soon, uh, including of course the Netherlands. Um, and we focus our work uh, basically only on supporting, only not, but on supporting democratic institutions and processes worldwide. And we do this by supporting elections and political parties, parliaments, and also constitution building processes. In fact, International Idea is the only organization with a dedicated team on constitution building. And International Idea is both, as they say, a think and a do tank um, in that we develop knowledge resources, including publications and databases, tools, also the global state of, uh, of democracy index. Um, but we also use those resources when we implement projects in many countries around the world. So our headquarters is in Stockholm, but we have regional offices in all continents and country offices in more than 10 countries. So when looking at this year's uh, conference theme, asymmetric power and, and the courage to concede, we thought that it would be interesting to look at a, at a series of countries that have for long been affected by conflict and that have also for many years attempted to transition out of conflict. The countries that, will be, uh, that we will be talking about include uh, Mali, hopefully if our speaker makes it, um, but also Myanmar, South Sudan and Yemen. Um, and they've in the past tried to negotiate and, and some of them are currently in the process of negotiating new political settlements that will basically help better define, limit, distribute, but also share um, the, the power of the state. And of course, the way power is structured and administered is, is oftentimes a key ground for the conflict itself and therefore often features rather prominently um, features rather prominently in peace negotiations between different parties, um, be it power holders and the opposition or state representatives and non-state, both armed and, and non-armed groups. But of course, these types of negotiations are never easy as we will hear today. Parties may be more or less committed actually to finding consensus around a new political settlement, but also the legitimacy of the resulting political settlement will depend as much as on as much on the content. So on the way precisely power is defined uh, and distributed, but also uh, fundamental rights are protected, etc. But also on, on the process leading up to it. So including the level of representativeness of groups and individuals at the negotiating table, their acceptance as to the process, um, and also the extent to which the public perceives its own, its own opinions, its own voice as, as having been considered. And hence, one of the key questions that we will be dealing with in this panel is how to support dialogue among key stakeholders, but also the broader public, in order to reach a new legitimate political settlement after conflict. And of course, the other side of the coin is thinking about asymmetries uh, between international and domestic actors, how to support these processes while reducing the sometimes inevitable dominance of international actors in these settings. So we will be zooming in to these four countries, as I was saying before, to first learn where the transition towards a new political settlement is in each of these settings, what are the key stakeholders involved in negotiating this new political settlement, but also what other actors that may not be directly involved in the negotiations, but have hopes to substantively contribute throughout the transition, such as civil society organizations or other minority movements or political parties, etc., are faring. 
since we only have 60 minutes uh, for this panel, I'd like to ask the panelists to, to keep their first interventions very short, maybe to five, six minutes. And hopefully we can then have a conversation later on and also on the legitimacy of the process and the stakeholders, uh, which is what particularly interests us in this panel. Um, and how the international community may be able or not to support uh, the emergence of new political settlements that also a majority of stakeholders can agree to. So I will now very briefly introduce the panelists, uh, but let me first just mention that the webinar has simultaneous translation, English, French. If you want to access the interpretation, you can find, I think, a small globus on the bottom of your page uh, that you can click on and choose the language you want to hear the proceedings in. And let me also just say that for all participants, if you have any questions, you can either write them on the on the chat or you can raise your virtual hand and I will call upon you as, as, as soon as possible after the panelists are done with their first presentations. Now, we're very happy to have um, our excellent panelists. So I see that Mumuni has not joined us yet. Um, so I'll introduce Janan. Uh, she's the executive director of the Nien Foundation in Myanmar and is connecting to us today from Yangon. Very welcome, Janan. Um, we also have Adam Abebe, uh, who works at International Ideas Constitution Building Program and has also for years been supporting South Sudanese stakeholders in their negotiations for a new federal constitution. And Zayda Lali, currently based in Tunis, as International Ideas Senior Advisor on Constitution Building in the Middle East and Africa region, has also for years been supporting constitutional negotiations in Yemen. Um, and I don't know if I'm allowed to say, Zayd, uh, but your most recent book just came out, Arab Constitutionalism, The Coming Revolution. And so without further ado, perhaps I can ask uh, Janan um, to start and tell us a little bit of what is happening in Myanmar. There was a coup, of course, on the 1st of February. Um, and how did we get there after 10 years of relative opening uh, with the win of two consecutive elections by Ai Kondo and San Suu Kyi um, to the situation that we're living now in Myanmar. Janan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kimana, for the introduction. And thank you all the colleagues who are uh, Zooming here together. Um, as Kimana already stated about current Myanmar situation, and I'm sure you are aware that Myanmar is now under, very, under the crisis situation after 10 years of challenging democratic transition. Um, you know, I had made a statement at the IDEA 25th anniversary event in last year, November, we're talking about democratic transition at that event, I had made a statement that was after the election, you know, 2020 election. I had made a statement that in Myanmar, democratic transition will not, it's not irreversible. That was the statement that I made. But today, I must admit, I was totally wrong, you know. My assessment, my analysis was totally wrong. Now we are going back to ground zero, you know. Uh, hopefully it's not total ground zero to, to transition the democracy. Uh, so on uh, February 1st, you know, military seized, the, seized control, the power from the elected government. And now we have two parallel government, de facto government, you know, led by military and also a de jure government. Uh, as of today, um, the the, the, the people of the country has been under so much uh, oppression and it's, it's more so than this kind of coup cool event back in 1988. So today, um, people are so much under fear, you know. Uh, so just, just to give you brief data about number of people being detained up till the end of October 13 was 7,240, but this, this is only rough number and it, it will be higher. And number of people have been killed by, you know, the military government, 1,170. Over, over close to 400 people have been sentenced and about 2,000 people are still arrest warrant and they are hiding in the safe place, you know, 
so this is this is just a rough idea what military government has been doing so far you know uh, but they are trying to show that they are legitimate government but as you know you know internationally the you know, french government eu had recently announced or uh, make a resolution that they support the jury government led by a national unity government uh, so but meanwhile de facto government trying to prove they are legitimate government but there is no support from the people except their allies, you know. Uh, so on the other hand, the jury government comprised of representative of the elected MPs from 2020 elections and also delegation of the ethnic armed organizations and CSO who were part of that, who are part of this de jure government are also uh, is supported by the majority population. So we do believe NUG, National Unity Government, the digital government has a legitimate power from the people because they have well representative in that government. How difficult working inside that government, that's another story. But at least on the on, in terms of representation, it's, it's much more representative than any other government that we have in the past. Um, another point that I would like to highlight is before coup, uh, in Myanmar, violent conflict is mostly uh, uh, break out in the armed, con armed control area, which is in the border area, border to India, China, Thailand, around that area. But after the coup, the violence conflict has been spread out throughout the country because young generation who are at the very forefront of what we call spring revolution movement, that's anti-military movement. Um, the young generations, we call Generation Z, have been leading this movement and they have formed up people defend forces throughout the country. They are disturbing government infrastructure. They are disturbing personnel because whatever they could do to disturb the function of the de facto government, this is what they are doing throughout the country. So, so far, uh, I think it's a rough, rough number that I had gathered. As of July, there are about 125, over 100, close to 130 uh, People's Defense Force being established throughout the country. That makes, that makes the, to make the de facto government uh, not function. So we see nowadays there are more um, this kind of destruction and uh, violence uh, to disturb the government function in the bigger city, including, you know, maybe the, the capital city and also Yangon, you know, and mainly in, in all those major city and major public areas are being disturbed. Just, just to highlight that we don't like this government, you know. So this, this is the recent development that you see since the coup. And on one hand, um, the another platform has been formed up, which is called National Unity Consultative Council. Again, this platform is uh, it, it, under this platform, Federal Democracy Charter has been under negotiation among the key stakeholders that include elected MPs. Uh, NLD government, uh, arm organization representative, CSO, and youth. So this this is a platform that emerging that we need to support. Public uh, people of the country support that platform because we feel that has the legitimate power to it, and that is a legitimate platform that discussing, negotiating on the federal democracy charter. So um, again, another issue, you know, how difficult, how challenging on the negotiating, you know, excluding the military, you know, excluding military, even in that problem, they are quite challenging considering the effect of the 70 years of conflict, armed conflict that exists in the country that has caused so much mis trust among the, among the many key stakeholders. So that 
you can also find the challenges of the negotiating of the federal principle, federal democratic charter at the, at the consultative council. So that is the challenge. But we should not be disappointed, uh, but there is a platform that we have to be, uh, we have to be grateful for, because on that platform, I would say we are talking about nation building and we are talking about state building because that is a platform that the stakeholder, all the relevant stakeholders, unusually civil society also have representation there. And youth and the strike committee also have representation there. It's not only the political leaders, but they are representative from the people. So this is the platform that I understood. They are, there is a deliberate dialogue in that platform. So we hope that that will also be leading for to build this nation and at the same time to build the new state, federal democratic state in the in the coming years. So this is the hope that we have. So therefore, in this situation, international community are also wondering how in the war we could support Myanmar in this in this difficult moment, because we don't want to support de facto military government. But, you know, something that we need to do, you know. So therefore, international community should continue to support uh, thinking what the future Myanmar will look like, what the future uh, federal, uh, federal democratic Myanmar will look like. So considering that vision, international community should continue to support like you were supporting before, you know, like, uh, IDEA has been supporting on the constitutional process uh, from various aspects. EU has been supporting on the uh, election process. So in the near future, we will be we will be continue to build the new state. So therefore, uh, reflecting what the current key actors are thinking under this difficult moment, what can we do? This is also the question that we ask of we asked by the people inside and the same question by the international community what can we do at this moment where the dialogue is not there yes there are attempts by ASEAN and I don't know whether UN special envoy is giving up on Myanmar I don't know uh, so international community along with the armed group actors are also trying to to find a platform for dialogues for the future but at the moment Negotiation, dialogue, mediation is not a favorite word at the moment. People don't want to hear. This is not timing yet, but for, for the right timing, we have to prepare when it comes to the, when, when we are ready for the negotiation, uh, when that time comes, now we have to prepare. So this is the thinking of the key stakeholder of the inside the country that, okay, we should not be just sitting around, but we have to be thinking what, when it comes for the dialogue, what are the things that we should be prepared now? So that is one emergence of the dialogue platform is also one thing that everyone would hope to see because armed groups knows, and I hope military also understood and accept that military means is not the way to solve the problem political means dialogue is the way to solve the problem. I hope military will also accept that concept, you know. So, but the, the opposition group accept, okay, political dialogue, dialogue is a mean to solve the political problem. So this is the aim that we should also, all, all international community and people from the uh, people of Myanmar should put our efforts together to create that dialogue platform. So that is one thing uh, we should, uh, have in mind. And second is more in terms of federal matter. Um, the whole country has been under military dictatorship for many years. As I have said, there are many um, mistrust, distrust issue among the communities, among the different organizations. So in this situation, negotiating on the federal principle is challenging. So therefore, continue to give uh, concept or awareness on the federal, not just awareness, but working technically, supporting technically to the key stakeholder who will be negotiating on the federal charter 
or negotiating on the implementation of that principle. When it comes to the, all the details, there will be harder, harder to negotiate. At the moment, at the principle level, it's a you know it's a norm. On the federal principle, it's it will it, it it will be a bit easier. But when it comes to the details, you know the detail, the devil is in detail. When it comes to the detail, it will be harder to negotiate. So therefore, during imagine that time will come near future. So for that period, all the key stakeholders need to be prepared. Uh, that these are the things that we have to open our mind. We have to be able to think out of the box in order to really negotiate on the federal principle matter. So on this matter, international community uh, should continue to support the stakeholders and the public. Not only stakeholders need to understand, the public need to be aware because at the end, the public will have to uh, you know, endorse, <laughs> endorse that federal charter and federal uh, country. So therefore, um, I would like to say, don't, don't be discouraged, you know, uh, keep, keep, let's keep our finger crossed. Uh, even though there is, we think, you know, we don't, there is no light at the moment, but there will be light at the end of the tunnel. So we just have to keep working on it and prepare on it. So I would close this um, as my presentation. And when there's more question, I will again come in. Thanks, Nana and everyone. Thanks so much, Jenan. Um, also for a rather hopeful and positive presentation and quite a bleak moment, I would say, in, in Myanmar with the sudden breakup of a transition that started perhaps in 2010 with the first sort of free, uh, free and fair, not so fair, but free elections. Um, and as you say, this, this, these two parallel governments that have been created and your appeal for the international community to support both the dialogue, but also capacity building in terms of, uh, in terms of federalism. I hope we will, we will have the chance to discuss a little more, but now I'd like to uh, move to Adam. Um, and Adam, I'd like you to speak a little bit about um, about the situation, the transition in South Sudan after a gruesome civil war, 2013 to 2018, a peace deal signed by the two main parties, a very fragile um, unity government formed in, in early 2020. So how is the situation looking right now? Thanks, Kimana. Um, so, you know, in Myanmar, they are struggling, uh, still thinking about whether some kind of political settlement has to come out of uh, what, is, what is happening. In South Sudan, they are actually in the process of imp implementation of a political settlement. Um, what is unique about South Sudan is, is it the fact that the, the conflict started because of a fracture within a, a very powerful rebel group turned government, right? So I think that's, that's a unique, unique context. And, uh, you know, the, the, the party, the, uh, the South, South Sudan, the, the Sudan People's Liberation Movement um, was organized along, just like all rebel groups, along a, a, a command logic. And I think once they became a government, they, they really couldn't, they struggled to transform their thinking into an administrative, a governance, a, a governance logic. Um, and, and, and so all the actors that are now part of the contestation, that are part of the, the conflict, part of the political settlement captured in the 2018 agreement, um, and even those that are outside of this framework were all part of that big umbrella or, or organization. Um, and it was the inability of that organization, one, to uh, create a framework for addressing conflicts, uh, addressing inevitable power, 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 um, power competitions that ultimately led to the conflict that started in, in 2000, uh, 2013. Um, and if you look at, so, so essentially it's a conflict between brothers, um, everyone that is part of the peace agreement, but also out of outside of it um, are at some point work together. Um, and the 2018 agreement outlined several settlements. Um, so it, it first built in a classic power sharing agreement between the key, uh, the key conflict parties. 
um, and and like all power sharing agreements in in, in recent past, uh, it has been, it has been struggling. But fortunately, since 2018, uh, it has been holding the peace. Uh, 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 overall, it has been holding the peace. But this power sharing arrangement is supposed to be an interim one, um, and and to lead, it's supposed to lead to several re several reforms. First, in the, in relation to the security particularly in terms of um, professionalizing the army, creating a unified armed force. It's, it's, a, it's central to the entire pol political settlement process. Uh, and there's also reforms at focus on, on the economy. Um, some of you may know that one of the features of South Sudan is that it is a country that exclusively relies on oil. Uh, and, and, and that means they, you know, they don't have to worry. And, and of course there's, there is aid, but they don't have to worry about raising their money from the people they govern. Um, and, and, and so the, the, because the resource is specific, the struggle also focus on that specific specific aspect. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, both in the security and the economic sector, the reforms have been extremely, uh, extremely slow. And a third aspect is uh, reform in the, in the social legal uh, uh, angle. And in that regard, there is a, a requirement for a recon reconciliation, uh, and also accountability mechanisms. Again, also the, the process of implementation has been slow. And then perhaps uh, another key aspect is political, political reforms. Um, the, the agreement requires the, the power sharing government to work one towards uh, a constitutional reform process to pave the way for, 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 for elections. Um, and the, the transitional institutions have been established, some of them, the transitional legislature has been set up, the executive has been set up, um, but the constitution reform process has been delayed. There has been some movement in the last couple of months. Uh, there is now uh, a pending draft legislation that the Ministry of Justice and Constitutional Affairs has produced. And once cabinet approves it, it will then go to parliament for final approval, but, but that is already um, quite, 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 quite late. Um, and, and, and therefore, planned elections, which are supposed to happen next year, technically under the agreement, are very, very unlikely to happen um, before the constitutional framework has, has been set up. Um, in terms of the, um, you know, the external other actors, particularly civil society in South Sudan, they are recognized uh, partly because of international pressure, but also increasingly because they have learned to organize themselves strongly. Uh, they were able to uh, be recognized as signatories to the peace agreement in 2018, particularly the, the women's coalition. Um, at, at the same time, the, the civil society actors remain extremely weak, uh, and they also lack, just like the political, uh, political organs, the, um, uh, the, the constituency structures to support their, their influence. So they, they, you know, they have the capacity to nudge, to persuade, um, and perhaps also influence some substantive aspects of the political reform process. Uh, but in terms of affecting institutional aspects, in terms of the, the key uh, issues that are, um, that are dividing, that are, that are widening the fracture within the governing and the opposition parties, uh, unfortunately, they, 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 they have uh, very, uh, very little influence and also let, let very little, little capacity. Uh, and perhaps I'll, uh, you know, I'll close with, with one point. And, 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 and as, part of the, um, as part of the constitutional reform process, the agreement requires that South Sudan has to become federal. Um, so, so you know, initially when the, uh, the ruling party was cohesive, um, the focus was on the center. It was about you know, um, centralizing resources and, and sharing the rents. But once the conflict broke out and, and, and the fact that uh, some actors within the ruling clique rec recognize the difficulty of, of actually capturing the center, there has been extensive demand um, towards a move towards fed federalism. And there has been, it's a historical issue, South Sudanese, especially as when they were part of Sudan, uh, federalism was a key aspect of their demand. But once they became independent, um, there was less interest in it. And then it has come back again because, because there has been divisions in terms of who can control the center. Um, so, so federalism is an important aspect, essentially about uh, an equitable and guaranteed you know, division of resources and responsibilities and power. So that remains as a, central, a central point of contention that will continue to, to, be, to be critical. I'll stop there and we'll take questions later. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Adam. Um, actually, federalism is a central issue, not only to South Sudan, but actually to the three cases we will be talking about today, also Myanmar and, and also in a way uh, Yemen, and I hope that Zaid will, will speak about that a little bit. Uh, but what came out really clearly from your presentation as well is, is this asymmetry, right, between governing and opposition parties, the, the key stakeholders at the negotiating table and, and civil society group, and how political all the negotiations are around around the security sector reform, around the economic reform, around other social legal reforms that the country needs to needs to go through and the fragility of it as a result. Um, but Zaid, um, I'd like to ask you to talk, of course, a little bit about Yemen, um, although your expertise, of course, goes much beyond, but what has been happening um, in Yemen, a transition that started with a highly inclusive national dialogue truncated by conflict at the end of 2014 um, with a UN resolution uh, 2216 that, that through the office of the special envoy attempted to bring some but not all the parties to the negotiating table, but then ultimately perhaps the unwillingness of those parties to really engage perhaps in negotiations um, and beyond that in, in any type of reform, but perhaps you can you can tell us more. Okay, th thanks. Uh, thanks, Kimana, and thanks everyone for being here and also to the two previous uh, speakers. So, um, I mean, so you know, Yemen is experiencing conflict for a very long time. Um, I mean, this current conflict is particularly hor horrific, but um, the country's really been no stranger to conflict for, for I mean, just uh, you know, for as long as I can remember, uh, things have been going very badly. Um, this current phase of the country's history, I guess, started in 2011 with what's referred to sometimes as the Ar the Arab Spring, um, and that that uh, had a, a big impact in Yemen, but quickly militarized, and then led to an agreement, which led to the dialogue process, which Kamana just referred to which um, many people seem to still think was very inclusive. And it was inclusive in the sense that uh, there were a lot of people there in the room and uh, including a lot of people who'd, who've never had a role in decision-making. Uh, but at the same time, it wasn't particularly inclusive in the sense that um, main decisions were either not being taken at all or were being taken by the usual suspects. Um, and that, that goes to the federal issue, which you asked me to, to speak about. So there, there was a decision <clears throat> or there was a push early on in 2011, all the way to 2014 to, to establish Yemen as a federation. And there's a lot of resistance. You know, the, the main reason why there was a push for that to happen was as a way to sort of, you know, reintegrate the South into a more democratic and representative Republic uh, with Sana'a as its center. Um, but there was a concern amongst many that, first of all, many, many groups in Yemen, particularly groups that were dominated in Sana'a and in the north of the country, were not particularly keen on the idea of allowing genuine federalism to emerge in the country, uh, first of all. And second of all, there was a big concern that having a two-state federation, nor one northern uh, state and one southern state would be very unstable and eventually might break up. So there was some discussion about it in the dialogue process, but ultimately it wasn't decided. The ultimate decision about whether or not Yemen should be established as a federation, and if so, how many states there should be, and according to what map, was not decided in the in the dialogue process. It was decided in a presidential committee, and presidential in the sense that the president nominated all the members without consulting anyone. And they found in favor of, um, of, of his proposal, unsurprisingly. So, so that didn't work, you know, people, uh, you know, lots of groups rejected it right away. Some accepted, but many rejected, but ultimately that wasn't uh, something that was, never, that, that was ever gonna work. Uh, eventually what happened is that the constitutional drafting committee was established with a view to drawing up a constitution that was based on the outcomes of the national dialogue and that also incorporated the outcome of the presidential committee on federalism so his the president's six state formula um, and that committee worked for the better part of a year um, but that process ended in total failure they ended up drawing up the draft constitution but it was never formally discussed and 
um, the country was just basically engulfed in conflict around about that time. There's some co uh, controversy as to when the conflict started exactly. If it's, did it start in September or in January, September of 2014 or January 2015 or later on in 2015, but in any event, it started around that period. So end of 2014 and early of 2015, and there were lots of warring factions. So principally, you know, there's the government of Yemen, what's sometimes referred to as the internationally recognized government, because it is recognized internationally, um, which is basically the same so like uh, state that uh, that's been in existence for a little while, although many of the people have changed, but it's the same state, although it's also an exile now, so or mainly an exile out of Riyadh has some presence in Aden in the south of the country. And, you know, Ansar Allah, which is sometimes referred to as a rebel movement, but is the de facto government in the north of the country, including in Sana'a, and controls over two thirds of the population, even if it doesn't control a majority of the, of the territory, but most of the territory that it doesn't control is empty. Um, there's the Southern Separatists, uh, Separatist movements, the Southern Transitional Council, and others. And also there's international and regional actors as well, including Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Iran, and others who are involved in the conflict, which makes it more complicated to resolve the conflict than it would otherwise have been. So since the conflict started, there's been some attempts at resolving the conflict, uh, but it hasn't really been very, very intensive or very successful at all. There was one attempt to mediate uh, what was referred to as confidence building measures at the end of 2018. Uh, they were, in the end, it was more than just confidence building measures, but it was packaged that way. Um, you know, there was an, an offensive that was in the works to uh, take over the, a port uh, called Hudeida on the, the, the western coast of Yemen. And th th there was a big concern that uh, if that offensive took place, that it would lead to a breakdown in humanitarian assistance in the country and that it would accelerate and intensify an already existing famine. Um, so in order to stave off that offensive, this negotiation took place outside of Stockholm in Sweden to um, come to an agreement about how that port would be administered. And there were a few other issues as well that were negotiated on at the end of 2018. But by and large, all of those agreements were not particularly successful. You know, they didn't really change much other than that, that they stopped the offensive. And many people would say that that's enough. But, but, uh, but, in, in, but at the same time, the, those agreements made it more difficult to reach an agreement on other issues afterwards because what appeared to some parties to exist on paper or their interpretation of what was there on paper was not ultimately implemented, uh, making it more difficult for them to trust any subsequent and negotiation processes. Um, there were negotiations or at least discussions between Ansar Allah, or it's referred to sometimes as the Houthi movement, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, we don't know much about those discussions, but we know at least that they were taking place. There's not much information about how far they would have gone. Um, and the idea being that the Saudis will want to basically extract themselves from the conflict by reaching a bilateral agreement with Ansar Allah. Um, particularly about issues related to the border. Um, but we don't know much about that. And also there's a lot of um, assumptions that were made about how desperate Saudi Arabia has been to end the conflict, or at least to, to extract itself from the conflict. And that, that doesn't seem, those assumptions don't seem to be borne out by subsequent developments because they, they haven't, you know, those discussions just haven't led anywhere. Um, there's been some discussion as well between Ansar Allah and the Southern separatists. And that basically goes along the lines of what some people described as basically sort of like a de facto arrangement on the ground that Ansar Allah controls the north, the southern separatists control the south, the internationally recognized government is essentially in exile. Um, and so therefore, if Ansar Allah and the, southerners, and the southerners reach an agreement, then they can de facto control the whole country, either by some type of arrangement between them, or at least to agree not to enter a conflict with each other and for both of them to control their respective territories. Um, and there's, there's a new UN envoy uh, who just started a few weeks ago. So we don't know much about what that new envoy is going to do yet. Um, it's too, far too early to say whether or not that's going to change anything. But you know he's trying to build a strategy and some new momentum. We have to wait and to see 
whether or not that's going to create sufficient dynamics for an international mediation effort or a new international mediation effort in Yemen. But within the current top context of what's happening currently, the conflict uh, dynamics, is that it's not particularly conducive to an agreement for various reasons. So one is because Ansarullah uh, or the Houthi movement are uh, engaged in uh, an offensive in different parts of the country, including in Madhub province, which is an important key province in the country. There is, most experts agree that it's just a matter of time until Madhub falls. I don't know anything about the conflict dynamics, but that's what other people have said. Um, and apparently it's what the Houthis believe. And if it's what they believe, and they basically just don't have any real incentive to negotiate today, given that they may believe that they can take over the whole country eventually, or at least they may believe that if they can take over Madhub, then their negotiation position will be far improved in the near future. So why negotiate now when they can get a better deal for themselves in just a few months? Um, there's serious tensions within the government of Yemen because of the southern separatists are formerly part of the government of Yemen. Um, but they, there's, there's just a lot of tension between them. And every time there's a new bout of tension, it leads into the southern separatists just taking, taking over more and more authority in the territory that they control. Um, there's a lot of emerging actors on the ground that control territory. So even if you were able to negotiate a settlement, those emerging actors on the ground aren't part of any of the structures that are involved in any types of negotiations. So uh, it would take some doing to convince them to sign on to an agreement or at least to be part of an implementing mechanism. Um, and then there's the war economy as well, which Kimana has said in the past that is a common to all countries. And I think that's right. But many people have said that in Yemen, it's a particular, particularly bad um, issue that needs to be resolved. And so far, not much has been done to, uh, to do so. Then the, then the last thing I'll say, and I'll conclude on this, is that the uh, overall paradigm for negotiations is also, I mean, this is another problem is that, so one problem which I've already discussed now is whether or not you can have negotiations, whether or not parties want to negotiate with each other. Um, but even if they were negotiate, willing to negotiate, and even if they were able to reach an agreement, part of the problem is that there's just not much on the table in terms of ideas about what would go into that type of agreement. I mean, basically all we have to offer so far is a power sharing arrangement and you know between people who so far don't want to share power so that makes it really difficult to make it work but even if they were willing to share power the problem with that is that if they could end the conflict in that way whatever comes next would have enormous trouble alleviating the suffering that exists in the country um, i mean power sharing i mean everywhere that we've seen it being implemented be it in, you know, in Lebanon or in Iraq or elsewhere, even in Yemen, it just doesn't work uh, because while they can create peace between warring factions, and some people have argued that that's enough, uh, it at the same time maintains the daily violence against ordinary citizens in the sense that hunger and poverty isn't alleviated. And sometimes in some cases, despite the end of conflict, poverty and hunger actually increases over time. Uh, that's certainly been the case in a lot of other countries. And some would even say that it's uh, what's been happening in Yemen over a period of decades. Um, and so if we want to negotiate an arrangement in Yemen, we'd have to, first of all, you know, find some way to bring uh, parties to the table, but so far that hasn't been happening. But second of all, we'd have to go a lot further in terms of our own imagination and they would have to do more as well it's not just our responsibility but you know everyone would have to do a lot more to um you know create some type of structure that's more likely to work not just for the war factions, but for the general population as well which gets so easily forgotten in this type of thing so i'll stop there thank you thank you so much Zaid. um a really really bleak picture for Yemen, um, but we'll see with the new special envoy whether things might improve, whether the paradigm of the negotiations may change and he might find a way. Um, I'd like to ask you also questions about that, but perhaps it's now, since we only have uh, 15 minutes until the end of the session, perhaps I open it up for questions of the participants. And 
I see that Tom Dirks is, uh, is also with us uh, today. And I'd like to ask him also, because I know that, uh, that he's, um, well, he's a fellow at, at Swiss Bees and he's doing some research on, um, on how insurgencies become governments also on South Sudan particularly. And it would be really interesting um, if you could say something about how these insurgencies turned governments may lose, may be touched with their own constituencies, may lose legitimacy and so forth. So Tone uh, and afterwards Stephen. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Kimana, and also thanks to to all the panelists for the for the interesting input. Um, I think in in relation to what was said about South Sudan, I I, I largely agree with Adem. So I, I think he was very much on point. Um, perhaps one um, thing that 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 stands out, at least in 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 my own uh, research, is that I think what groups like the the SPLA are 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 um, quite good at is is to mobilize people for a, a common goal and, and in the case of South Sudan the, the there was a sort of common enemy for a long time in in uh, different uh, uh, Khartoum governments um, but when once that goal was reached and and once uh, well first the CP, CPA the, the the comprehensive peace agreement was signed and, and later independence came a lot of the um, uh, expectations changed so expectations changed from from people that were part of the SPLA expectations changed from the international community um, and also the expectations of, of South Sudanese uh, citizens I think what is interesting to see in these cases is that often the uh, hope for for a better future is it's is, is is very high uh, and at the same time a lot of new challenges uh, emerge and i think what what adem also rightly pointed out is that that in a way um, losing the, the sort of militaristic mentality that is can be very effective at at uh, during war um, can create a lot of uh, problems in 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 a uh, sort of post conflict um, setting, um, and then I think what you also see within the SPLA is is that the the sort of the inability to come up with effective succession mechanisms in leadership. Um, is 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 also what what is part of the problem at the moment, and 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 in a way, some of the um, like institutional solutions, so to redraw administrative boundaries and so on. It it is it is part of a negotiation process, and maybe what will come out is a is a is a more federal type of system compared to to what there was before, but there's also a sort of darker side to it in that by constantly redrawing administrative boundaries and, and signing new agreements and so on, it creates a lot of uncertainty for people um, that work for the government. And, and what you get is, is a sort of parallel patronage uh, system. Um, and, and so I think these, some of these challenges, they're, they're, they're very uh, old um, in, in South Sudan, and, and I expect that they, they will, will, uh, will remain, uh, remain there. So I think, yeah, I'll leave it there also, also considering uh, the, the time. Uh, thank you. Thanks, thanks so much, Tone. Um, changing asymmetries, um, I think, is what came out mostly out of, uh, out of your comments. Thank you so much. Um, Stephen Gray, maybe you can very briefly introduce yourself uh, before you ask your question. Sure, I'm at Stephen Gray. I'm the director of Adapt Peacebuilding. I have a question for Janan in particular about Myanmar. Janan, it's good to see you again. I hope you and your family are doing okay. Um, my, my question is on the theme of the conference of asymmetric power uh, and about challenging power. So it's, it's very clear in Myanmar that there's a situation of asymmetric power between the military and every other stakeholder. And it's, it's political power, it's military power, it's economic power. And uh, one of the challenges for so many years has been how to build a coalition that can challenge that power uh, because they can't be defeated militarily. 
and politically one of the failures of this transition period in the last 10 years was the inability to find a, a stable coalition that could challenge that power and the disappointment many have with Aung San Suu Kyi, as you know, is she wasn't the, the unifier that people hoped that, that she would be. So my question is for this nation building uh, in exile, uh, but also within the country, um, what are you seeing in terms of building of unity between the ethnic nationalities and the, the democracy opposition. Now that we have, everyone has seen the, the common in it, enemy without its, uh, the wolf has taken off the sheep's clothing. Are you seeing more unity in how um, the, the NUCC or the NUG is going about trying to build a stable coalition? And do you think that that might be enough to, to challenge that asymmetric power in the future? Thank you. Should I respond it now, Kimana? Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, Stephen. It's good to see you here, and I'm sure you are still closely following <laughs> um, the issue. Uh, yeah. So this is the uh, challenge. So I, 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 I would like to say that, as you rightly say, coalition to challenge the common common enemy. Uh, has been this, the moment has come now, yeah. Uh, but how uh, challenging or how easy that coalition will still be, a, it's a question. Uh, so looking at the, the current coalition among the anti-military stakeholders at the NUCC platform, that consultative council platform, uh, I see there are two trends. One is for sure, the common enemy, the common goal is to get rid of the dictatorship. So there's a common goal among the anti-military anti, anti stakeholder group. Common goal is there. But how, how do you uh, achieve that common goal? There are slightly different views. So that, that will make it difficult among the among the stakeholder working on that nation building platform. Some, some, some stakeholder feel, okay, let's focus, let's focus first on the, to get rid of the common enemies. And let's deal along the way among the trust issue, trust issue among the stakeholders. So some, some stakeholder think, strategically, let's focus first on the common enemy and then deal among each of us as a process. It's, it's going to be a long process, building the trust between um, majority Burma ethnicity and non-Burma non ethnicity. So this, this is the uh, challenges that we are seeing under the negotiation among the stakeholder now. So therefore, if if some uh, stakeholders also join the strategy, okay, let's get rid of the common enemy first. And accepting trust building is a long-term process. Even though you may, you may have a good relationship with this particular group in the future, forever in, this, in the community that we will continue to build trust. So therefore, let's not, let's not focus too much on the mistrust issue among the Burma ethnic and non-Burma ethnic. This will be there many years. We will need to continue to build, but let's focus first on the get rid of the common enemies. So that's, that is if conceptually, if they could agree, if they come up with the agree common strategy, then the coalition will continue to be strong, that I would say. And as, as I said earlier, at the, the, the consultative platform, NUCC platform, there are deliberate dialogues happening at that platform, so which is, which is good. Not like a union peace conference, you know. At the union peace conference, we make it very ceremonial. You know, the, the opposition groups coming to the negotiation table, you know, you just, okay, you know, 
we have to make it good. We have to we have to make the conference look good. We have to make the dialogue good. So you don't go deeper. But and the, at the NUCC platform, there are deliberate dialogues among the stakeholders, and you go deeper and you try to understand each other about why you're saying this, and they address to each other. They they really do talk to each other. So there are dialogues happening. So we have to keep that dialogue space going. You know, hopefully we will keep that dialogue moving and coalition will continue. So I think uh, stakeholder believe this is the time for us to come together. Thanks so much, Hanan. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, it looks like we just started this conversation and we could go on for hours, uh, but we only have three more minutes. And one great question that I'd like to read out for the, for the uh, panelists um, and perhaps give you 30 seconds to respond uh, and just make a note that we should continue with this conversation. Um, the question comes from Michael Asiedu, um, and he asks about the role of third external parties, I assume, uh, who have strategic interests in all of these countries in South Sudan and Yemen and Myanmar. Um, why should parties involved in the negotiations, local parties trust these third parties and how do we measure the expectations of citizens in these conflicts who have who have actually been let down so very much. So if I can give you 30 seconds, um, unfortunately the organizers will also cut off um, this, uh, this uh, panel, uh, but I'd like to give you a chance to, um, to say a few words um, to finish this panel. You want to start Zaid um, and we go the other way around? Okay, happy to do it. Um, so thanks again for, for this great uh, conversation, but um, so on, on that question, um, one thing I found in the different countries that I've worked in, um, and I've worked in around 10 now, is that um, people by and large, uh, you know, human beings um, want the same things. And I don't mean that in a, in a negative way, I mean that in a positive way that it's not difficult to, um, to guess what it is that uh, someone who suffered from conflict wants in Yemen or in Libya or in Sudan. Uh, they typically by and large all want the same things, which is stability, um, a relatively good health clinic for their children and for their families, and also schools and uh, a chance of having a decent life with a good job. That's typically what people want around, around the world. Uh, at least in the countries that I'm familiar with. So it's, you know, and that, that's a very good thing. It's good that people are by and large the same everywhere. Of course, there's important differences, but, but those core things I think are common to, to everyone. Um, what, what's not common, however, is third parties or warring factions and what it is that they want to achieve. I mean, typically they want power and access to resources, but the relationship between third parties and warring factions is always complicated particularly in a place like Yemen, because all the warring factions have relationships with third parties. Some of them are even proxies, like direct proxies, uh, either created or totally dependent on third parties. Uh, not all, but some of them are. And uh, where they're not, you know, where they're, they're not just complete proxies and there's relationships that exist between them, they can actually, they can sometimes be very, very complicated and not at all be um, what people think that they are. So in that sort of situation, you know, it requires a lot of in-depth thinking about what these third parties are, what their interests are, how far they are, they're willing to go in order to satisfy those interests, what means they're willing to use in order to satisfy them, et cetera, et cetera. It's not enough to just say there's a third party and therefore their interests are adverse to the interests of the general population. Um, that, that, can, that can be true in a lot of cases but that sometimes doesn't say everything that you need to know about uh, about third parties and their influence and role in conflict. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Zaid. Adam, super, super briefly. Thanks. So um, indeed, you, you're right. I think you know it's very difficult to um, to not think about the, the strategic interest that anybody, any external actor brings in. Um, in the context of South Sudan, um, there has been an attempt to uh, not completely, uh, you know, remove that, but to to, to limit it by allowing the um, regional sub-organization IGAD to lead the, ne the negotiation process. 
But the challenge, of course, is that neighboring countries also have a lot of interest, sometimes contrasting interests. Uh, and even some kind of partner, not in the sense of Yemen, where they are created and are fully dependent, but they, there are some interests and uh, interest alliances between neighboring countries and some of some of the uh, armed armed groups. So it's very difficult uh, to to get rid of it. But there's an understanding that it's critical, and the use of sub-regional or closer neighboring states can can help in in, in that regard. Um, in, in terms of measuring popular expectation, I I agree with with Zaid. I think it's very it's easy to know what people want in terms of the basics, you know, in terms of the hierarchy of needs. Uh, the challenge often is is at the structural institutional level, and and that is where the elites come in. And what kind of state structure should be? You know, you know, how should resources be allocated? What kind of transparent methods should be there? So it's often not on the substance. There's really very little difference on the substance of what people want. Um, it's often on the institutional structures. And, and that is why elites, elite pacts, elite negotiations, deliberations are always, uh, always critical. Thank you. Thanks so much, Adam. The organizers tell me that we need to close, unfortunately. Um, Janan, I'm going to leave it at that, but hopefully we can continue the conversation very soon. Um, I wanted to thank all the panelists excellent for their excellent presentations and all the participants. I hope you enjoyed uh, this panel um, and we'll continue the conversation soon enough. Um, so have a great day and hopefully you enjoy Thanks. many more panels at the KPSR annual conference. Thank you very much, everybody. Ciao. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.